Here I've got this nice integral from everyone's favorite problem suggester. What I like about this integral is it involves exponential functions, logarithmic functions, as well as trigonometric functions. So we hit a lot of the different types of functions that you see in calculus. So what we have here is the integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus x natural log of x times sine of x minus cosine of x. Now to get off the ground, we'll look at part of this integral, the part that's involving sine x, and we'll do a quick calculation involving integration by parts. And our choice for u and dv will be as follows. So we'll take dv to be e to the minus x dx, because that's the part that we know how to integrate. And we'll take natural log sine of x dx to be u. We know how to differentiate that. So let's see. That tells us that du is equal to sine of x over x from taking the derivative of the natural log plus natural log of x times cosine of x dx. That's from taking the derivative of sine. Then next, v will be equal to minus e to the minus x. That's from the antiderivative of this e to the minus x. Okay, good. Now using the standard integration by parts formula, we'll have this is equal to minus e to the minus x times natural log of x times sine of x. So that's our v du. And then we'll have plus the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus x sine of x over x dx plus the integral of e to the minus x cosine of x or natural log of x cosine of x dx from zero to infinity as well. That's just splitting up our u times v evaluated from zero to infinity and then our v du into two parts. Now a pretty quick limit trick will show us that this whole thing goes to zero. That's because our exponential will beat out our logarithm as x goes to infinity. And then let's see, the sine function will beat out the logarithm as x goes to zero. And we're left with these two integrals. But notice one of them, this one is inside our original integral with the opposite sign. So that means it'll cancel and we'll be left with just this thing right here for our original integral. So that means we can take our goal integral and rewrite it as the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus x times sine of x over x dx. Now we'd like to think about how to get an x in the denominator. And we can do that with a certain antiderivative of an exponential that really points towards turning a single integral into a double integral. And in fact, what we'll have here is the integral from zero to infinity, and then the integral from one to infinity of e to the minus xy times sine of x dx. Okay, so why does that work? That works because the integral from one to infinity, sorry, this should be dy dx because the integral from one to infinity of e to the minus xy dy is in fact equal to e to the minus x over x. I'll let you guys check that, but that's a fairly straightforward calculation. Okay, nice. Now we'll take this sine function and express it using complex exponentials using Euler's formula that e to the i x is equal to cos x plus i sine of x, which means sine of x is in fact just equal to the imaginary part of e to the i x. So that means we can take this whole thing and write it as the imaginary part of the integral from zero to infinity, the integral from one to infinity of e to the minus xy times e to the i x. So that's going to be equal to, let's see, e to the i minus y times x dy dx. Great, so I put some things together there. Now next, I'd like to take the bounds of integration and switch them. And I can do that by Fubini's theorem. So that gives me a dx dy instead of a dy dx. 
But now it's fairly straightforward to take that interior integral. That leaves us with the imaginary part of the integral from one to infinity. And then we have one over i minus y of e to the i x times e to the minus x y. And then we'll have that's evaluated from zero to infinity d y. And so this is x equals zero down here and x approaches infinity here. Okay, so if we let x approach infinity, notice this term right here will go to zero, this e to the minus x, y. That means all we're left with is this x equals zero term. And if we set x equal to zero, we'll get one for each of those. So that's a nice simplification. So since x equals zero is the lower bound, and I'll actually give us a minus one. So here we have, this is the imaginary part of the integral from one to infinity of minus one over i minus y, and then we have, let's see, dy. But now we need to find the imaginary part of this thing right here. Maybe we'll do that over here to the side. So since y is a real variable, that i is the only thing that's contributing to the imaginary part. So let's see, we really need the imaginary part of one minus y, one over y minus i, taking that minus sign and bringing it down. So we'll multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate, that'll leave us with the imaginary part of y plus i over y squared plus one. But again, the y's are real, so our imaginary part is one over y squared plus one. So we've got one over y squared plus one. That leaves us in a really good spot. We have the integral from one to infinity of one over y squared plus one dy. That's a standard antiderivative of the arctan of y evaluated from one to infinity. As y goes to infinity, inverse tangent will go to pi over two. And inverse tangent of pi over of one is equal to pi over four. So we have pi over two minus pi over four. And in the end, that gives us pi over four. So that's our final answer. And that's a good place to stop.